Um, homework two is due today. If uh, you have not turned that in, please do so. Um, now, uh, one quick thing on homework one. So I went through the solution on homework one, and I did notice a typo on my end, and it affected some of y'all's grades. I didn't get a chance to go through each of the assignments one by one. So I'm going to give that back to you on Friday, but I'm holding that back because I'm like, well, I'm not going to take points off for you for an error on my end. But I need a little bit of time to go through it right and do it correctly. So I'm going to go through that probably either today or tomorrow. Uh, and uh, on Friday, I will return that. I did have the solution turned on on Blackboard. I turned it off because I noticed there was an error. But I will have that sorted out by Friday. Um, I gave you homework three today. Um, it is much shorter. There's only two problems as opposed to homework uh, two, which had five problems. Um, so there was a lot going on there. Uh, this one's a lot shorter. And another thing about homework three, whereas like we were sort of like covering homework two as we progressed, after today you'll be able to do the entirety of homework three because it's pretty straightforward. Yes. Yeah. Is a oh, that's that's there. I just threw the twelve. Okay. That should be the twelve. That was a copy and paste error on mine. It's the twelve. As soon as you saw it, I know what that is. So it's the it's due on the twelve. All right. Sound good? All right. Now, y'all uh, wanted to see what was going on with the last problem. Did y'all want to see that? The, the, the triangular beam? All right. Hold on. Okay. Um, what I want to do today is go back to our discussion of ACI reinforcements, and I want to go back to the in-class example that we looked at last time, and I want to sort of uh, uh, tie that uh, tie that up, if you will, sort of close that off. Um, I put here on the board a bunch of stuff. Okay, um, I did this for a reason. Um, we're starting to get a lot of symbols and a lot of terminology and a lot of um, concepts thrown at us. I, I started you off kind of easy on that. I said, okay, if I use the letter B, that is the width of the beam, right? If I use the letter D, that is from the top of the beam to where the steel is, right? And, and, and I will always be consistent with that. But then suddenly it's like there's all of this stuff. It's like, whoa, where did all this come from? Okay. So I decided I wanted to take a second and let's back up and let's make sure that we understand what all this stuff is and what all these terms are. Uh, and then we're going to break them down one at a time, and then we're going to have an example where we compute a lot of this stuff. And the reason why this is important, so first time I was teaching this class, I didn't actually have much lecture devoted to this. I said, oh, they'll just pick it up as we go. And then, you know, I got some feedback, like, man, there's a lot of stuff thrown at us all at once. It's like, well, let's take a second and actually digest all of this. In fact, your homework three is devoted solely to making sure that you understand all of these basic terms and values. So that when you get into design, it's not, oh, not only do I have to figure out design, I have to remember what all this crap is. So it's, I wanted to, to take it slow, if you will. So let's go back to some fundamental assumptions and let's go through it together. So we have our reinforced concrete beam, and right now our discussion is limited to a singly reinforced beam. So it's a beam that only has reinforcement in the tensile region, and we're also limiting it to a beam that is rectangular. And the reason why is because a rectangular beam is about the simplest beam, or it is the simplest beam that we can analyze from a math perspective. You know, the area is base times height, the moment of inertia is bh cubed over 12, it, it's simple. Later on, we'll look at T-beams and doubly reinforced sections, but for now, we're keeping it basic. All right? Now, um, for this beam, one of the assumptions that we make is that plane sections remain plane, so our strain profile is linear. Okay? We have zero strain at the neutral axis. Our concrete has a maximum strain of 0 0.003. The steel strain down here, that varies. That depends on... You know, what the beam looks like, what the material properties are, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, right off the bat, there's a couple things I want to make sure that everybody here understands. Okay? There is a difference between how deep the stress block is and how deep it is to the neutral axis. The stress block is AD. The distance to the neutral axis is C. Okay? So, right there. So, that's why I have the depth of the stress block, the depth to the neutral axis. 
I will always call this A and I will always call this C. I will never call it anything else. Okay? So you can hang your hat on the fact that that will always be the term that we use. Okay? Now, um, again, the beam is B wide. I say D tall. I mean, it's H tall, but D is the, distant, the dimension that we care about for design from the top of the beam to where the steel is. And the steel has an area of A sub S. Okay? And I'm using this terminology very, very specifically because, for instance, when we throw compression steel in here up top, we call that AS prime. And the distance from the top of the beam to that steel, we call that D prime. So I'm, I'm being very, very choosy with my terms. Okay? Now, for our strain profile, we always assume that the concrete has a maximum strain of 0 0.003. That is a maximum value, and it is constant. And that's because regardless of our material, bless you, regardless of whether we're dealing with 4 KSI concrete, 5 KSI, 6 KSI, 0 0.003 is a reasonable maximum cap, regardless of our, um, uh, regardless of our, 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 our material, regardless of our compressive strength. So it's a good, simple estimate. Okay. Now, again, this is A, that is C. They are related by this term beta one. Okay. So uh, if I the the ratio between this depth and that depth is this term beta 1. Okay? So A equals beta 1 times C. So if I had C and I multiplied it by beta 1, it would get smaller and that would be A. Okay? Usually we'll use it backwards. Like we'll compute A and then we'll back calculate what C is by saying A over beta 1. Don't worry, we'll, we'll do that here in a little bit. Now A equals beta 1 times C. What's beta 1? Beta 1 is a factor that accounts for the difference between those two, and it's a factor that, that sort of expresses uh, the beam's ductility. If you have a beam, or if you have a concrete that has a much higher compressive strength, higher compressive strengths, higher strength means lower ductility. Okay? And so beta 1 kind of represents that. Um, as our compressive strength goes up, beta 1 goes down. Okay? And it basically follows this pattern. Anytime our FC prime is less than 4,000, it's 0.85. Anytime it's greater than 8,000, by that I mean PSI, anytime it's greater than 8,000 PSI, it's 0.65, and that's a linear fit in between. Remember, okay, and I'll, I'll sort of write this here, okay, this is beta 1C, this dimension here, this is 0 0.85. FC prime. Okay, that's 0.85. That's beta one. For normal, typical concretes, for four KSI concretes, beta one just happens to equal 0.85. Okay, but to be crystal clear, this is not always 0.85. This is. Okay, so that's a really easy thing to, to, to mix up. Now, a couple other things. We do have our minimum requirement for steel. Uh, ACI says, I don't care how much steel the math says you need to put in the beam, you are at least putting this much steel in the beam just to meet ACI requirements. And the idea is that it guards against sudden failure. Usually in most design scenarios, this does not become a problem unless you're designing a beam that quite frankly just doesn't see much load. If it's a very lightly loaded beam, there is a chance that this limit will become an issue. But if you have a beam in a typical uh, uh, commercial structure, that's probably not going to be a problem. You need to check it, but again, probably not going to be an issue. So it's B over D divided by FY times the maximum of those two quantities. So a couple things to keep in mind. There's a square root of FC prime. So you put in PSI, you get out PSI. And two, um, because we're dealing with PSIs, the FY, it needs to be in PSI. You can't use 60. You have to use 60,000, okay? So make sure that your units uh, are copeset. Now, let's go back to the strain profile. I actually have my strain profile drawn backwards here on the board, like it's starting that way and that one over here is going like that. It doesn't really matter. Um, just so you recognize that, you know, the concrete's in compression and the steel's in tension. Now, what I'm using here on this slide is just similar triangles to figure out what the strain is here, okay? Now, uh, this whole time when we did this, we were talking about stresses. You know, the concrete experiences the stress of 0.85 FC prime. The steel reaches a stress of FY. So why am I talking about strain? If, if stresses determine what my strength is, why do I care about strain? Well, there's a couple reasons. 
Um, first, there are some codified limits in the spec that tell us the steel has to reach certain values. So number one, you care about strains because the spec tells you to. But two, these strain values help us verify our assumptions. See, technically, when we looked at this, we assumed that the steel yielded. Um, well, how do we know that that assumption is valid? Well, one of the ways that we know that is by checking what is the strain in the steel. So if this is a constant 0 0.003 and that distance is C, how can I determine that? Well, 0 0.003 is to C as whatever the heck this is, is to D minus C. So just similar triangles. So that's why I have here 0 0.003 is to that as this strain is to that. I'm solving for this and so just multiply that over. That's what I've got. And so that computes the strain in the steel for us. Okay? Why is that important? Well, like I said, we can compare that against the steel at yielding, right? Now I have here, I'm going to tell you, I have here epsilon sub y. Sometimes I'll refer to that as epsilon sub ty. It's the same thing. So if you want to change that, you can, but just the strain at yielding. So what is the strain at yielding? The strain at yielding is Fy divided by the Young's modulus. And again, where does that come from? It just comes from looking at our stress-strain curve for steel. So here's steel, there's the strain, there's the stress. And so what does the stress-strain curve look like? It's linear until it yields, and so it goes off like that. So that is our Young's modulus. That is Fy, and so what I'm after is that strain quantity, that, that yielding strain right there, or we can call it some epsilon some Ty. And what is that? It's just Fy over Es. It's really nothing magic. So the idea is that what we would do is we would compute the strain in the steel and compare that against the, the strain that's required to cause yielding and see, well, we assumed that it yielded. Did it actually yield? Um, so that, that's sort of the idea. We also compare that <laughs> against the limiting strain. So ACI has a limiting strain value, which is basically that strain plus 0 0.003. What that is is the, the specs way of telling you as the analyst, I don't care how you design the beam, the steel has to yield at the ultimate stage. They actually want the tensile reinforcement to yield, and they, they, they mandate it upon the designer. Okay? Um, when you're in design mode, there's a lot of variables up in the air. You're the one choosing how wide the beam is, how deep the beam is, what's the area of the steel. You can very easily pick some cross-sectional values where the steel doesn't yield. Okay? Um, and that's something you don't want to happen. Okay? When the, when the behavior of the beam is governed by the steel, in other words, the steel yields first, we term that a tension-controlled beam. Okay? What do I mean by a tension-controlled beam? Okay? Well, tension-controlled members and compression-controlled members are really, really fancy terms for the concept of brittle behavior, or, uh, brittle behavior and ductile behavior. Now, we as structural engineers would most likely, would pretty much universally uh, uh, um, pre or prefer that beams and elements behave in a ductile mode. Okay? What that means is I would like to see a lot of deflection and a lot of warning of failure before that happens. Now, in reinforced concrete land, remember you have beams that are comprised of concrete and steel. Okay? Well, when steel yields, it experiences large deformation and there's a, a, a lot of ductility there before the steel actually snaps. You can definitely notice it. How many of you um, uh, have had 321 where you pulled the alloy specimens, the A505 specimens, and ripped them in half? So, if you've seen that, you know, you can tell that sucker's seeing a lot of deformation when it when it's stretched. I mean, I mean, if you look at it before and after, I mean, the A505 specimen's like this, and it's like that when it's done. I mean, it's definitely stretched. You can see it elongate. You can see it necking. You can see all of that, that deformation before it happens, okay? 
Now, compare that to the cylinder test. When you're watching the cylinder test, you hear the you hear the load going. Next thing you know, boom, it's, it's, it's gone, right? There's really not a lot of warning when that happens. It's just load and it's done, right? That is brittle behavior, okay? Brittle uh, uh, failures are sudden uh, and tend to be fairly dramatic. And uh, when I say dramatic, I mean like pre present a significant danger to loss of human life, okay? So in reinforced concrete land, when I say a beam is tension controlled, what I'm saying is that it's governed by the behavior of the steel. The steel is going to yield well before the concrete crushes, okay? And so we consider, we, that's what we want. We want elements to be tension controlled. Compression controlled members are when the concrete fails first, okay? Now, um, in, like, like, like I said, we would always prefer members to be tension controlled, but there are instances where that's not going to happen. So can anybody think of an element where the concrete is probably going to crush before the steel yields? And we don't have a choice. We're talking about beams now. That's about the best thing I can do. So what element where, would the concrete fail first and we wouldn't have any way of controlling it? I heard it. Somebody say it. Columns, right? In a, with a column, the concrete is going to crush first. And there's no way around it. Okay? You don't have a choice. Okay? Um, and so we handle that not only through its classification, but through what value we use for that, for our resistance factor. Okay? Um, our resistance factor, remember, there is a difference between our nominal moment capacity. In other words, what's the theoretical maximum load that we can put on that beam before it fails? There is a difference between that value and the design moment capacity, what we're allowed to use for design purposes. Okay? So what I can tell you is that if we have a tension controlled region or a tension controlled member, we're allowed to use more of this than if we had a compression controlled uh, section. Compression controlled section uh, sections, this value is much lower. And because this value is much lower, it reduces our design capacity that much more. So, so brittle members we define as compression controlled. Uh, 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 ductile members we would say are tension controlled. There is sort of a, a, an area in between, like a, a murky gray area that we call a transition region. Uh, and so transition regions are sort of somewhere in between behaving brittly and behaving ductily. I mean, I gave you the two polar extremes, either, you know, large deformation or sudden failure. Something in between would be something like a beam column in a building, something that is not only being pushed, but also being bent. So if a building is seeing like a wind load or an earthquake load, it would probably be somewhere in between. And so our resistance factor changes uh, accordingly. Now, Remember, strength reduction factors are, they're the uncertainties. Remember, like way early in the semester, we talked about the uncertainties associated with design, like there's uncertainties associated with the loads and how good we are in predicting how much dead load and live load and snow load and all this stuff is uh, on a structure. Well, there's uncertainties associated with the resistance as well. I mean, if you were in 321, you remember that you probably tested multiple cylinders. Did they all report the exact same compressive strength? There were some scatter to them, right? Especially, you know, from uh, as the, the, the concrete age, there's, I mean, we're making assumptions here with these equations. They're not perfect. They're good enough for government work. There's approximations there. And so strength resistance factors, or uh, we, uh, sometimes they're called strength reduction factors. Usually I'll just call it a resistance factor, uh, is meant to account for those uncertainties. Now, this is the equation or, or the model that we use in ASHTO, or sorry, in ACI to determine a strength reduction factor or a resistance factor. I'll go ahead and tell you this, okay? In design mode, when you're designing a beam, all beams are required to satisfy this limit. The strain has to be larger than that. So when you're designing a beam, you're basically saying it has to be tension controlled. And if it's tension controlled, phi is 0.9, okay? I'm going to tell you on your homework three, I want you to check this limit. And if your member is not tension controlled, if it's a, in a transition region, I want you to compute phi. Just because 
that can become important later when we look at bean columns. You need to have the ability to be able to assess that. Okay. Now, like I said, there's compression control, transition, and tension control. If you have a compression controlled section like a column, your feed value is much lower. We're placing a much more stringent limit on what we can use for design purposes because if it fails, it would be much more drastic and much more sudden. So if you want a, a quick and dirty uh, explanation, for beams, usually your feed value is 0.9. And for columns, usually your feed value is 0.65. Again, because if a column fails in a brittle fashion, it's going to go quick. It's going to cause a lot of damage really, really drastically. But if a beam fails and it's tension controlled, you're usually going to have a lot of warning. It's going to be a much more prolonged failure. And there's going to be, a, a amp, hopefully, ample opportunity to get out. This transition region, this is just this uh, straight line equation here. All this is just the equation of a line. You know, y equals mx plus b, that's your intercept, and that's your, your slope, and so on and so forth. So that, that's all that is. Any questions? All right, so like I said, you got two problems. I'll go ahead and tell you. you got two problems on your homework assignment. One's tension controlled, one isn't. So the one that isn't, you can't just say p equals 0.9. You have to check it out. All right. One final note on notation. Um, I've been using this term E or epsilon sub T, the strain in the steel at the tensile reinforcement. Tech, if I'm being specific, there is a difference between the strain at the centroid and the strain at the very, very bottom. Um, more often than not, for our design purposes in this course, we're going to place our steel in a single layer anyway, so it doesn't really uh, matter. Um, all the single layers. I should put an O-ring on it. I should. Um, I'm the dork. It's okay. Um, but a, a quick uh, note on the terminology. A lot of these limits that I've discussed are referring to the bottom layer, hence epsilon sub T. So there's a difference between the, st uh, the strain at the bottom and the strain sort of at the centroid. So that's just a quick uh, note on the, the notation here. But we're going to be dealing with single layer reinforcement anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Any questions? All right. So we're going to go back to this problem. Um, this is the problem uh, from 5A. We computed the nominal moment capacity of this. Okay. It was 4 KSI concrete, 60 KSI steel. Um, I actually want to go back and pull this beam uh, up. And I want to see um, what we did previously. Because we're going to continue on with this example. And so basically what I want to do in this example is take what we did and continue on with all of this, okay? So here's the beam, 4 KSI concrete. Now remember, I told you this last time that because we're dealing with a beam that's 4 KSI concrete, the beta 1 value is 0.85. We didn't use that at all last time. We're going to use it now because now we've got, you know, stuff to do with it. Uh, we have a, 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 a nonlinear stress distribution that we uh, approximate with this stress block, 0.85 FC prime AB, tensile forces ASFY. So we've got, okay, equilibrium tells us that compression equals tension. Compression equals tension tells us that we set these terms equal to one another. The one that we don't know is A. So solve for A, and we got an A value of about 4.17 inches, something like that. So then we look at our moment capacity, and our moment capacity is about as simple as it can get. We've got a force couple that basically looks like that. I mean, look right here. We've got a force that way, a force that way, and we have a moment arm between them. So what's the moment? The force times that moment arm. It's that simple. So the force could be compression or tension. It doesn't matter which one that you use because they're both equal. Okay. So if I'm lazy, that has four terms, that has two terms. Just use the one with two terms. Um, as for the uh, moment arm, the moment arm is D minus A over 2. Again, the distance from here to the very, very top of the beam is A. So halfway down, I get the distance between those two. So ASFY D minus A over 2 is the moment arm. One of the things that I chose not to do up here on the board is say, okay, here's the equations that you need to remember. 
let me be clear, these equations will always work for singly reinforced rectangular beams. But as soon as we get a T-beam or a doubly reinforced section, it's not the equations that matter. What matters is your ability to understand this and derive your own equations. Now, don't worry, from here on out, we're going to do that together, but I really want that exercise to stick in your head. That's why I gave you the triangular beam on homework, too. It wasn't because I was trying to be mean. It's because you kind of need to go through that exercise, even if you trip up and stumble a bit. Sound good? Okay. All right. So let's continue on with this example, and let's press forward and see what we can do uh, in ACI land. Okay. So let's, let's look at a couple of things. All right. Let me turn to where I left off. All right. So let's recall. Let's recall a couple values because we're going to need these. So we have an A value of 4.165 inches. We have an MN of, what was that? Um, I think it was 246.8 foot kips. We've got, okay, let's look at the concrete, an FC prime of 4 KSI. And so that meant that beta 1 is... 0.85. Then we've got FY is 60 KSI. Now, one of the things that we did not compute last time was the strain at yielding. Okay? And so I kind of want to do that now. So let's do that over here. So the strain at yielding is FY over ES. So that's 60 KSI over what? 29. 29. 30 KSI. There you go. I want that number <coughs> burned into the back of your head by the time you graduate. E, Young's modules for steel is 29,000 KSI. Just like the unit weight of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. See, I know very little about fluids. Um, okay. What is this? We'll say, uh, so it's going to be a really small number. Um, give it to me like in five decimal places. So I'll go ahead and say it's like zero point something. Zero, zero, two, zero, seven. All right. Do I have a second on that? Okay. I'll go ahead and tell you for grade 60 steel, you can go ahead and take that as .002. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But that's for grade 60 steel. If you ever have a steel grade that's not grade 60, you got to compute that. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. All right. Now, the reason why I'm computing strain values is because ultimately, uh, like I said, we're going to start uh, checking ACI limits. And so really with ACI limits, I'm after three things. I want to look at these strains and see if they comport with ACI specifications. Based on that, I want to determine this. I want to determine VMN. And finally, I want to check and see if I'm meeting my minimum steel reinforcement requirement. That's what I'm after uh, with this example. So the first thing I need to do is compute the strain in the steel. Now, to compute the strain in the steel, I need C. I need this distance. Okay. So if you recall, We've been saying that A is beta 1 times C, so C is A over beta 1. So usually in practice, you're actually using this way. The spec defines it as A equals beta 1 times C, but you're usually dividing. So this is 4.165 over 0.85. And so that's what? Four point nine. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. I think it actually comes out like it's like four point nine like zero zero. Like it's it's like four point nine. So again, going back to your dimensions, this one is about four point one six five inches. That is about 4.9, so it's a little bit bigger. 
Now, let's then compute the strain in the steel. So the strain in the steel, remember, 0 0.003 D minus C over C. And again, I'm just using similar triangles, okay? 0 0.003 is to that, as whatever this is, is to that, okay? So just solving for the strain, okay? And again, I can't stress this enough, like these formulas work for singly reinforced sections. But don't get married to this is the formula. It's more about understanding the idea because as these beams get more and more complicated, it's more about, okay, am I using the right formula? And if not, what needs to happen for it to make sense? So that, that's kind of important in here. So, oh, eraser. 0 0.003, and then what was the D? What was that for this? 23. 23 inches. Minus 4.9 over 4.9. That equals what? Check the form, the parentheses, yeah. Sorry, say that, say that again. Uh, 0 0.0111. Something like that, right? Check your parentheses, because you might have a parentheses thing there. Did anybody else get this? Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you if there's any... One formula I guess I could write up here, it would be your limiting strain value, which is the yielding value plus 0 0.003. I guess I could go ahead and write that up here because that is going to be constant. Now, where am I getting that limit? I'm getting that limit, again, straight from ACI. So I just want to make sure everybody's seeing where I'm coming up with that. So, again, according to ACI members that are primarily flexural elements, so primarily beams, and like I said, when I say primarily beams, we have plenty of elements in buildings that are being bent and pushed on. So it could be both. So members with very little axial load, the, the strain has to be bigger than this. And so this is what I'm saying is the limit, the strain plus 0 .003. Okay. So, so that is strain at yield plus 0 0.003, so 0 0.00207 plus 0 0.003, 0 0.00507. Is that okay with that? Did I go too fast? Now, before we move on, I want to make a few observations. Okay, because we computed some values here, and there's some things we can glean uh, uh, from these quantities that I think are very, very important. All right? Um, Let's start off with a basic one, okay? When we computed our capacity, one of the things that we assumed was that the steel yielded. We just said, okay, this tensile force is the area of steel times Fy, okay? When we did that, again, what we said is we assume that the steel yields, okay? Does the steel yield in this problem? Well, let me ask you to this way. What is the strain at yielding? Like if I take grade 60 rebar and I yank on it, when does it yield? It yields when it hits a strain of 0 0.00207. What is the actual strain? 0 0.0111. So does it yield? Oh yeah, it yields. The strain is five times what it is required to yield. So the first observation I can make 
is that assumption that the steel yields is valid. In other words, the strain is much greater than the strain required to yield it. Now, let me be crystal clear. When we're doing singly reinforced beams, 999 times out of 1,000, that will always be the case. However, with doubly reinforced beams, when we look at the steel up here, there is a very strong chance that that yields, but that doesn't. Okay? And when that doesn't, you have to be careful as to how you perform your analysis. So I'm making you go through this, not only to check your designs, but because we will experience scenarios later where that doesn't happen. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Okay, that's observation number one. Observation number two. ACI requirement has been met because the strain in the steel is greater than the strain or the limiting strain. that I can make. The third observation goes to this. Can somebody look at this slide and tell me what's the third observation we can make about this thing? And what does that mean? in the reinforced steel is equal to the... Well, we've already said the strain is bigger than that, but what does that mean for our design purposes? What does this graph plot? The strain versus what? The resistance factor. So for this beam, what's the resistance factor? 0.9. That's the third observation. Okay? So there's three observations to be made about this, these strain values. We made an assumption that the steel yields. That's a valid assumption. The ACI requirement has been met. The third uh, is that because it's tension controlled, V is 0.9. So therefore, VMN is 0 0.9 times 246.8, which is what? Say 222.1 foot kits. So on homework one, when you had your floor system and there was like a dead load of 35 pounds per square foot and a live load of 75 pounds per square foot, what you would do is look at that floor beam and say, what's the factored moment on that beam? You would compare that not against your nominal moment, but against your design moment. Why your design moment? Because it's apples to apples. This value is your nominal moment adjusted for uncertainties. The 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, that's your dead and live load adjusted for uncertainties. That's what that 1.2 and 1.6 is doing. Okay? Why the live load factor is higher because we're less certain about the live loads than we are the dead loads. Make sense? Yes, sir? 
I have a kind of conceptual question. Absolutely. So we want our steel to yield past this lower limit. Mm -hmm. Is there like a limit, like an upper limit of too much yielding? That's a great question. Um, I, I would sort of say the answer to that question is no, because remember, your stress strain curve, now if your stress strain curve looks like this, right? This is what it looks like for steel, right? In order to get here, you got to have a ridiculously proportioned mean. So much so that, that that really wouldn't happen in reinforced concrete design. For our purposes in reinforced concrete design, you can pretty much assume that your stress strain curve is either linear or yielded. You don't have to go into this land. Now, let me say this. In steel design, when you're taking a member and yanking on it, that's all you're doing. You're just putting tension. So is there a limit to how much you want it to deform? Yeah. That's why in, in steel design we have gross section yielding, but net section fracture. You know what I mean? In this world, just because of the proportion, again, the, again football analogy. Okay? If you wanted to look at this like it was a football field, like let's say this is the end zone, that's about the one yard line, that's about the 10 yard line. That's 10 times more strength that you rarely get to that point. So again, um, I guess the short answer, yeah, but you really wouldn't get there. So, that's a great question. Any other questions? This is good stuff. I have one final check to do, and that's to check to see did we meet our minimum reinforcement limit. This is a really quick check, so, so we'll say minimum steel reinforcement. So AS min equals B D over FY. Now it's here, let me be a little neater with my writing. It's B sub W times D. Now that's the width of the web, but when you have a rectangular beam, that's just the width. Times the maximum of 3 square root of FC prime and 200 PSI. Alright? So over here off to the side, 3 square root of FC prime that's three. What was FC prime for this problem? Four PSI. So it's three square root of four, right? Thousand. That's right. You put in PSI. You get out PSI. Don't forget that. So what is three times the square root of four thousand? No, that that that's that's that, that's that's your modulus of rupture. Yeah. One eighty nine point seven. One eighty nine point seven psi. Do I have a second on that? Yep. So what's the maximum? Three square root of FC prime or two hundred? Two hundred. So we're gonna have a fraction. What was B for this thing? I don't remember. 10 inches, D was what? 23. 23 inches, 200 PSI, and what goes on the bottom? 60,000. 60, exactly, 60,000 PSI. Alright, so what does this come out to be? We can finish this real quick and then we'll call it. This is 0 0.76 repeating. Say it again. 0 0.76 repeating. So we'll say, I don't know, 77. Seven. If it's 766. Okay. What is the actual area of steel for this beam? Remember, here's the beam. 2.36 square inches. So, did we meet this limit? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, we provided more than enough steel to meet that limit. So we'll say ACI requirement net. Again, because we provided way more steel than, than that limit. More than often, that will be the case. Like, we usually will not have a design scenario where we have to come back and worry about that. But you still need to check it, especially in scenarios where your beam just isn't seeing that much load. Sound good? All right. One final thing, and then we'll call it. So I want to explain homework three. So here's the homework. So what I've given you is two beams. Uh, this beam and this beam. This is actually from the last homework. This is problem four from the last homework. So here's two beams, and for each of those beams, I want you to do five things. I want you to compute the nominal moment capacity. I want you to compute the tensile strain and the steel reinforcement, ask, or determine if it meets ACI requirements, determine the value of phi, and if the beam fails the strain requirements, it's not going to equal 0.9. Okay? I want you to determine phi in and then finally determine whether or not it meets strain limits. And I want you to do that with two beams. Okay? So that's a, I mean, basically what we did today, do it two more times. That's your third homework, and you got a week for that. I want you to just have time doing just that because next time we start talking about design, how do we proportion a beam to resist these loads? That's next time. That's all I got. See y'all. We'll most of you here.